Good evening, Cupcakes. So, originally this video was supposed to be the Grand Bazaar review that I promised way too long ago, and whose script I've had typed out for months. But in that review, I was gonna say all sorts of things about various characters, specifically Sherry, that should have their own video. Add to that a revelation or two about myself that really doesn't belong in the review, but is relevant to the discussion, and here we are. Before we begin though, we're getting close to 500 subscribers, which is the point where I unlock the ULTIMATE POWER that is community posts, so if you want to see me post memes and gifs with each video and stream, then make sure to subscribe. Shiri's main criticism comes from her being a generic character. For a while, I really didn't understand what people meant by that. Sure, she's of a particular archetype, like Ellie from Friends of Mineral Town. The shy character could be considered of Mary's archetype, and the tomboy would be Anne. But a character that conforms to a particular archetype is not necessarily generic. Brienne of Tarth is the archetypal knight character, but is she generic? Obi-Wan fits into the mentor archetype, but would anyone really call him generic? Merc Sanchez is unquestionably the mad scientist archetype, I could go on. So she's not generic because she fits the L archetype. What makes her generic then? Well, let's look at some of her defining characteristics. Her very first heart event is about how she dedicates her time to others, and her second one involves her offering encouragement to you in your work. Everyone looks up to and relies on her father, Felix, and she has inherited that trait in a somewhat different way. They look to Felix to solve problems, and they look to Sherry for comfort. If this was all there was to her character, this could be cause for calling her generic. In fiction, you can have someone be the rock of the community, while the character has no memorable traits revealed to the audience. And Sherry is more of a pillow of the community, or a warm blanket. Second, she is effectively her father's caregiver. While Felix is far from infirm, it's been very well established that he is so incompetent when it comes to cooking or cleaning that he is worse than infirm. Instead of being incapable of even attempting these tasks, he is capable of attempting them and making things more difficult on Sherry. This could certainly end up making her generic. If your sole defining trait is takes care of X person that is more interesting, that is the perfect description for a generic character. But there's more to her character than that. There's one final defining trait to consider. The third and final defining trait to consider for whether or not Sherry is generic is her aspirations in life. Her aspirations are simple. Be a wife and mother. For a lot of people, this is what sends them over the edge of calling her generic, but it's also what makes her wholly unique. Yes, there's more to it than just this, as this aspiration co conflicts directly with the issue of caring for her father, forcing a choice between duty and desire that is at the core of so much quality writing, but there's more to it than just that. To explain what is so important about that last trait, let me ask you this. Where in popular fiction do you find another character whose ultimate goal is to be a wife and mother? Keep in mind, I'm not talking about a woman who wants to get married or have kids, but rather one for whom this is the highest aspiration as opposed to a side goal. And never mind the difference between having children and being a mother. So many that have the goal of having a child consider it quest complete once a single child is born. The reality is that openly having being a wife and mother as one's ultimate goal is a whole unique trait in fiction. I've been thinking back to all the books I've read, the TV shows and movies that I've watched, and I can't think of a single major character where this was truly the case. Aside from the having children examples, which are numerous but are not comparable, I managed to think of a few that might come to mind. First is Daenerys Targaryen from A Song of Ice and Fire. The show doesn't betray her thoughts, but early on in the books, she dreams of a red door, which symbolizes a simpler life. Presumably, this would include being a wife and a mother. In the books, she is told that she can never have children again, a conversation that notably did not actually happen in the show, but that's aside from the point. But she does become the mother of dragons, and, well, look. Crazy cat ladies may refer to their cats as their children, but they sure as heck aren't. Same thing goes for dragons. Aside from that, the simpler life dream goes by the wayside as well. While Book Daenerys has not gone quite so far as she did in the show, yet, her goals take her about as far away from the wife and mother dream as can be. 
second would be from that same series, Sansa Stark, but from the very start, there's no simple life involved. Her dream is to be a lady of a major house, then queen, then back to lady of a major house. She doesn't want to be a mother to children, but to princes and lords. Stepping away from Asoaif, there's good old Simpsons and Family Guy. Frankly, I haven't watched much of Modern Simpsons. I have no idea what's going on with Marge in the later seasons. I know that in Family Guy, Lois hates her life and her family and wants to be free of it, but but is also fiercely jealous of it simply because that's all she has. Even if both were the perfect picture of motherly housewives, however, not only are their husbands and children warnings against such things, but they also exist in parodies. The Simpsons being a parody of 90s family sitcoms and Family Guy being a parody of The Simpsons. Speaking of 90s sitcoms, while many of these shows featured men and women that would be considered exceptional fathers or mothers, I can't find an example of one where their goal is that path, where that role is central to their identity. Rather, they are lawyers or actors or police officers or any number of other jobs who simply happen to be exceptional in a task they do not consider often in the day to day, and perhaps the most difficult of tasks. And they do it as a side objective to some other mentally taxing and time consuming career to which they dedicate themselves. Again, their goal is more to have children, not be a father or mother. They just happen to do the latter effortlessly. And the 90s were, uh, were a time of false promises. Even when we go within the series and the very archetype of Sherry's character, we find her to be unique. The Ellie archetype is one that's found in a number of ranch story games, but simply because this motherly trait is found in these characters does not mean that they prioritize motherhood. Ellie herself is driven to be a better nurse, and while that is a very motherly job, it does show that her priorities are elsewhere. To be clear, Sherry has a job too. She sells seeds at the bazaar. Like most residents of the town, she is working to make the bazaar better and contribute where she can. Whether or not a character has a job is irrelevant to this issue. The issue is the focus of their dreams. Does the job support their overall goal? Is that job a side objective? Ellie is not a nurse in order to be a better mother. It's not a side objective to her primary goal. It is her goal, which means that being a wife and mother is secondary. While Sherry is a good candidate for mayor when Felix retires, though Claire, Wilbur, and Lloyd are prime candidates as well, it's not a set goal for her. If it happens, it happens, and will likely be for the purpose of making the town better for her children, much like her work to help improve the bazaar. The point is that Sherry is unique in fiction in that she is a positive example of really and truly putting family first. It's easy to say family comes first in fiction or in real life. It's another thing to live it. Now, while I have talked about a few examples in fiction of characters that might come to mind when discussing Sherry's aspirations, there is one character that shares her aspirations and is the reason I said that she is unique as a positive example. Tywin Lannister. He's an often misunderstood character largely because many of the viewers of the show are incapable of perceiving the world as he does. Tywin Lannister cares about his family, but understands that that extends past his children. That in the grand scheme of things, his life and the lives of his children are irrelevant. But long after they're dead, the family will survive. His very first scene explains all of this, but so many can't see his actions as for the benefit of his descendants. All they see is a man who would sacrifice his children for his own personal glory. Even if they could, though, his ambitions for his family make him willing to do horrific things for the sake of power. The point is that the only clear example I could find of someone whose highest aspirations are for their family is a villain. Of course, that is a common propagandist tactic, distort a value and then criticize the distortion, but that's aside from the point. Maybe in the dark depths of harem anime or more forbidden works, one can find such characters, but I will be discussing neither those sorts of animes nor the others, especially since I would not consider either of those to be positive examples. At the current time in this video essay slash rant, we are three pages in. Why in the world would I spend so much time and effort talking about this? Why is it so important? Why do I care? Well, for a few reasons, but first and foremost, because I am Sherry. No, this is not a confession that the haha -ha girl pretending to be a guy joke is real. I guess it would be more accurate to say that I'm the Rule 63 version of Sherry. My ultimate goal in life is to be a husband and father. 
All else comes secondary to that, or is in support of that. And I did spend 10 years as a caregiver for my mother, spending most of those years wondering if I could ever work towards my goal and ensure there was someone to take care of her. I was faced with that same decision Sherry confronts in her final heart event. I may not be a pillar of the community, but I do admire that aspect of her, and other than that, it fits. In some ways, I guess I have a bit of Tywin Lannister in me as well. No, I don't seek political power either for myself or for my descendants. Rather, the power I seek is to shift people's priorities, for people to prioritize understanding over trivial knowledge, truth over ideology, honesty over personal or ideological benefit. I'm not the first person to seek this, nor will I be the last, but those who history remembers that have sought this have sought to achieve it in their lifetimes or the lifetimes of their children. I recognize that such a shift will take time, that even under perfect circumstances, a shift in my own country towards this will take generations. It's not achievable during my lifetime or the lives of my children, and trying to race towards that goal will set things back further. So I seek this goal not for myself or for my children, but for my descendants whose great-grandparents will never meet any of us. Maybe history will forget my name. Maybe my life will not contribute towards this. Maybe one of my children will be the one who history remembers for this. All of that is irrelevant, because this is a secondary goal to benefit my family long after I am gone. To create a better world for them. Not based on what some ideology promises, but for that world to craft understanding far beyond what we could possibly achieve, what any ideology could dream. But whether or not any of that comes to pass, a husband and a father is what I strive to be. Everything else is subservient to that. But in all of this, I recognize that I am not unique. Sherry is not truly unique. She is unique in fiction, but in reality? So why would such a unique character in fiction be classified as generic? It astounds me just how often people declare thoughts and feelings that are objectively not only beneficial to reproductive success, but entirely necessary to it as caused by societal pressures, while they identify the things that they push that are objectively detrimental to reproductive success, or even guarantee reproductive failure, as the core of one's very being. And and even understanding evolution at a most basic level should prove what a lie that is. Yet such claims are so commonly believed. Do you see why I want to see understanding spread? That a low level of understanding of one subject can prove false the knowledge so many people espouse shows the power of understanding and overcoming false claims. But it's more relevant to this topic than that. The fact that my ultimate goal is to be a husband and father does not make me unique. It makes me honest with myself. Human history has extended through hundreds of generations, and for thousands of generations before history. In that time, do you suppose that people that were happy being childless were more or less likely to have children? Oh, but societal pressures don't matter to this discussion. Societal pressures do not demand a specific quota of children, and no more. They do not demand a specific quota of time spent raising those children, or the specific lessons given to those children, well, aside from public schools of the modern day. At no point in human history were societal pressures more significant nor more uniform than in the 1990s, thanks in large part to the advent of mass media and before the days of social media deprived by dissenting voices, not to mention the aforementioned public schools. Yet uniformity was not even close to achieved in that time. And never mind that societal pressures throughout history follow the same rules as evolution, not to mention that they have to be built upon our natures or else collapse on themselves once they are challenged with any significant force, much like social media did to the social pressures of the 90s. They still have sway, mostly because mass media has not fully died, but they are far weaker than they once were. Societal pressures may push people to be more likely to have children than they otherwise would have been, or to have more children, but they do not create uniformity, nor do they completely quash our natures. A person who does not want children will be less likely to have children than one that does want children, regardless of social pressures, and if they do, they will have fewer children than those that want children or want more. 
Over time, these differences compound. The effects increase exponentially. Even if societal pressures were so overwhelmingly powerful throughout the entirety of human history and all of prehistory, because those traits are inherited as well, that the effect was minuscule in a single generation. Over the course of hundreds, let alone thousands, the effect becomes overwhelming. Those genes that incline people to not want children or to value anything more highly than family have effectively died out. Prioritizing anything else is a path to misery. To be fair and more clear, there have been accidents of evolution. Things that do not prioritize family directly, but benefit one's family or increase the potential size. I mentioned something like this in the Grand Bazaar Husband Overview as to why men pursue power. It benefits the ultimate goal of being a husband and father and puts one's children in a better position to achieve that goal as well provided one survives. But regardless, this is why characters like Sherry cannot exist in fiction, or else be demonized like Tywin. Because this is at the very core of our being, it calls to every one of us, to what is in our very souls. We are all Sherry. That is why she is generic. What makes her unique is that she is honest. She does not fight what is at her very core. She embraces it. She lives in a world where nobody is telling her that she must set aside this desire, that others need her to set aside this desire, that she must indulge in such unseemly goals, it be secondary to her primary goals. In that, she has the advantage. For the rest of us, though, it's harder. You know, if I had a nickel for every time a woman in my life went from, oh, I don't want to get married or have children, to... Darling, I dream of watching our children play while sipping tea with the other mothers. I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's strange that it's happened twice. Especially given those ten years of caregiving. I wasn't exactly pursuing a family of my own in that time. Well, I could say it's because of how passionate I am about my goals, or that it's because of my bizarre superpower of being able to convince women of anything I say. I know it's more about the fact that I spoke to that part of them they had spent so long denying. There's a lot more that I could say on this topic, and a lot more that I wish I could say, about the morality of it all, and human nature, and debts. But I had two days during my spare time at work to type out this rant or video essay or whatever you want to call it. And this is what I could do. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something, and I hope you achieve some level of honesty with yourself. Hard hands.